I have a question. In fact, I've just entitled this sermon, Defining Success. Defining Success. Here's the question. For a Christian, what does success look like? So at the end of your life, if you were to stand before the Lord and you were able to uh, answer the question, did I live a successful life, what would you say? Would you point to uh, what you did in sports? Would you point to what you did in academics? Would you point to what you did in business? How would it be that you would define success? Because I would suggest to you that if we're not careful, we'll live our lives based on one model of success and we'll end up having to give an account for a whole different kind of model of success. Our nation is one that loves success. In fact, uh, I would say that success is its highest priority that uh, if you were to uh, distill all the values that we have as Americans success would be the most uh, valued of all of the things that we hold to Uh, and we define it in different ways long life we would say that long life is success Um, Pastor Tom's father was in his 90s when he passed away. We have folks who are in our congregation who are in their 90s. And so in some ways, we would define that kind of living as success. Uh, What about financial gain? We would say that those who have lots of money would be in some ways successful. In fact, in some places, the word success is synonymous with lots of money. So we would say, he's a successful businessman. That's a nice way of saying that dude is filthy rich. All right, so that's, uh, we use those words interchangeably. If I said we have a se- successful ball player, that would be someone who would achieve uh, some of the greats. I-, I was able to watch one in person and two by TV, two of the greatest ever to live this last week. I went to the Hornets game on Friday night, and I was able to look down and seated on the row because he's an owner of the team was Michael Jordan. I sent my son a Twitter, uh, or not, a, I didn't tweet to him, I actually texted to him, I texted him, I said, the goat is in the house, right, because goat means greatest of all time, so, and he said, this is generational now, he wrote back and said, I thought LeBron had his own game tonight. It's generational. We have different ideas of what the greatest of all time. But if we were, and then yesterday, I don't know if you watched, I watched the football game last night with Tom Brady, probably the greatest quarterback ever to play, at least by successful terms. And you say, what's success? It's winning. But when we begin to apply success to our lives, obviously success is some measure that we use to move towards. How is it that we as believers are going to consider ourselves successful? On the day that you go to be with the Lord, what is going to be the marker for your success? Join with me, Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 9 to 14. I'll quickly put them into context, and then I want to just look at this, defining success. If you would please stand with me as we honor the public reading of God's Word. Colossians chapter 1 starting in verse number 9. God's Word says this, and so from the day we heard we have not ceased to pray for you asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord fully pleasing to him bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins." May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You be seated, please. And so, Paul here is... Uh, he is still part of his introduction. In fact, the whole first chapter is really Paul's introduction to this letter that he's writing to the church at Colossae. And what he's doing is he's going to call them ultimately to see that Jesus is better than any other option they have. 
You say, well, why would they think something different? They were a church. Yeah, but the, the, the climate of the culture had begun to seep into the church so that they had gotten some of the things mixed up. They had philosophies that were coming into the church, philosophies that were saying, well, if you lived a certain way, then you would have a certain kind of a blessing. And so Paul is writing this letter to say Jesus alone gives blessing. And by the way, I think that's a great reminder for our church, for the American church, for such a time as this, because if we're not careful, all kinds of other other things, other definitions of success, other ways of worship, other hope for eternity will begin to filter in if we don't hold to Jesus alone as the as the as the benefactor of of grace, the one who gives us good things and so as we gather together we see that Paul is is saying these kinds of things and then starting in verse 9 he's saying how he prays for him now you say well pastor Jim I didn't hear this idea of success anywhere there well there's it's found in two places Uh, I'm just going to show it to you and then uh, I'll preach the passage Uh, two places first if Paul says we pray for you all the time we never stop worrying about praying for you, we, we are always praying for you, then you ought to think that the things that he's praying ought to be the most important things that he's asking for them. And so that's what's happening. He's praying for the most important things. Number two, we see that he's praying that we, well, ultimately the Colossian church, but ultimately us, that, that we would live a life fully pleasing to God. And so this means a manner of success. If our lives are to be lived out for God's glory, then we ought to do what pleases Him. And so let's just look at this. The first thing I want you to see is that success is knowing God's will. Success is knowing God's will. He says, so from the day we've heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. What did they hear? He heard what God was doing there at Colossae. Remember, this was a church that Paul had never visited. And so he had never been there, so from the day we heard, we started praying for you. Asking what? Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So success is knowing God's will. Now, I want to ask you a question before I preach it. I'm just going to take a poll, and if you don't want to participate in this, don't worry. I set folks up last Sunday, and they'll never forgive me. So uh, this isn't really a setup, but let me ask you a question. How is it? that we are to know God's will. How do we know God's will for our life? That's exactly right, through his word. In fact, it's easy in lots of ways to know God's will because he's given it to us. What we've done in the last, I don't know how many years, but at least as long as I've been alive, what we've done is we've turned God's will, knowing God's will, into some kind of super secretive, really mystical thing. Like, oh, maybe if I just could figure out God's will for my life. Uh, Is it God's will for me to marry this person? Is it God's will for me to take this job? Is it God's will for me to buy this Corvette, which is really neat? And uh, I think yes on that. That's just my, my guess. But is that God's will for my life? Well, I want you to know that you can pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray, and God will never answer those kinds of questions for you. You're saying, are you serious? You mean I can't know who I should marry? I can't know to have a Corvette or not? I can't know those things? No, because you see what God has already done is he's already given us all kinds of ways to answer those questions. If the person that you're asking who you should marry, if they're not a believer and you are, the answer is clearly no. You say, how do I know that? Because God's will says that. I mean, God's word says that. He tells us clearly that we ought not to be unequally yoked. And so if you're looking to get married and you, are, you have all these different suitors, if you're like me, you've got like 100,000 you could choose from. <laughs> no, I am married to the only one that said yes. <laughs> but if you, are, if you are looking, the answer is they have to be of like belief. There has to be agreement as they walk together. Uh, The Lord says uh, for us to lay up our treasures in heaven. Now, if you've got a Corvette, that's between you and God. Let me say two things. I love Corvettes. I love Corvettes. I love Corvettes. They are awesome. But I can guarantee you, guarantee you that that's not God's will for my life. I know that 
Why? Does it say in the Bible, you shouldn't have a Corvette? Has God ever said that out loud to me? You shouldn't have a Corvette? No. But with a Corvette comes all kinds of problems for a Baptist preacher. I can think of two. All the deacons would want to drive my car. And I'd get way too many traffic tickets. So for those two reasons and others, I shouldn't spend $70,000 for a car for me. That's just not what I need to do. You understand? So there's lots of reasons why I know that's not God's will for my life. Even though Corvettes are the awesomest cars ever to grace the earth. That's just my own humble but most accurate opinion. (laughs) So how is it that we know God's will? We read his word. He clearly opens it up for us. But know also that what Paul is doing is he's praying and asking that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. So it's not just reading the Bible and knowing it, but that that through the Holy Spirit's application in our life, this filling of God, God himself in our lives, that because he lives within us, we walk according to his will. And so we read his word, and the Spirit himself takes it and applies it to our lives, and we know those kinds of answers to the questions. But there are other things, you know, that the Bible is really clear on. This is God's will for your life. Your sanctification flee sexual immorality. Well, I can tell you always and forever, it is never God's will for you to be sexually immoral. Because God's word clearly says that it's not. And then his spirit will work that out in you if you indeed belong to him. Let me just tell you very quickly, uh, a a quick... um, Well, doctrinal, let me teach a little bit about the Holy Spirit. I don't have a lot of time, but I'll do this just briefly. This is the first time that really we've come across this idea of filling, and let me just say this. The Bible is clear that when we repent of our sins and trust Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us. You say, who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. God exists eternally in three persons. Uh, One God, three persons, eternally God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, comes and indwells a believer. He does more than indwell a believer. He recreates us. He's the regenerator. He's the one who makes us alive in Christ. He's the one that that binds us into, um, uh, into the body of Christ. He's the one who convicts us of our sin. He's the one who uh, illumines our heart from Scripture. All this is the work of the Holy Spirit. He is a person. He is completely God. And all of the Holy Spirit comes and indwells in a believer when they put their faith in Christ. He is able to be everywhere at once, which is why he can be completely in me and completely in you at the same time. All those are true. But on a daily basis, I must surrender myself to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in my life. What we call that is filling. We are asking for him to fill us up like a hand would fill up a glove. And so uh, when you put your faith in Jesus, we believe that you get all the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get. But day by day, you have to yield yourself to to his leadership in your life. You surrender to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We call that filling. He does lots of things in your life when you, le- when you uh, yield yourself to him. What we're interested in here is he fills us with the knowledge, with the knowledge of God's will. He did not leave us to just wander the earth aimlessly, but the spirit lives within, of us, within us. So this knowledge uh, is a work of God in Christ. This knowledge is founded on his word. Uh, this is the wisdom, and this knowledge concerns God's ways towards us. When you know God's wills, what you're knowing, what you're knowing is what he wants for you. What he wants for you. And so the only way, back to success, the only way for us to answer God about being successful is for us to walk according to his will. That's the only thing. In fact, in Romans, it says that to our own master we stand or fall. The reason for this is, is God's will for our lives are often the same, but very different ways to apply it because we live in different areas. Like, God's will for my life is to be the best pastor and the best preacher that I can be. That's one of his, the many facets of his will. He might not have that for you. And so we're not to compare what God's will for my life is for each other. Then there's some standard things that's God's will for everybody. I just said one of them. 
Your sanctification, my sanctification, becoming more and more like Christ. That's God's will for us. And so, success is knowing God's will. The second thing that I want you to see is that success is walking in accordance with God's will. It's not just knowing it, but it's also walking in it. Look at verses 10 and 11. Uh, Well, let me go back to 9 so you get the understanding of the so. Uh, Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So we're filled up with the knowledge of his will. Why? So that we will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So success is then walking in accordance with God's will. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. So first, walking in accordance with God's will is that we will bear fruit as we walk with him. Now, there's two kinds of fruit that the Bible talks about. Well, let me use Paul for specifics. Since Paul is writing this, there are two kinds of fruit that Paul alludes to as he, as he walks through. The first is what we know as the fruit of the Spirit. So the Spirit actually manifests, works out in us as he makes us look more and more like Christ. He works through us, and uh, he begins to yield this fruit in us. It's not our fruit. It's the Spirit's fruit who works through us. So we're kind of passive in this, except that we've yielded ourselves to the Lord. So when we yield ourselves to the Spirit, as we say, all right, Lord, you lead me in my life, what he will do is he will begin to lead us in love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, kindness, um, patience, and joy. Did I get them? Is that all? Did I get all of them? Self-control. 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 I missed one. So that's the fruit of the Spirit. And so as we yield ourselves to Him, He bears that out in us. So you say, well, how do I know if I'm yielded to the Spirit? When those, when those fruits mark our lives, you know you've yielded to the Spirit. And, by the way, if we look at fellow Christians and say, oh, they're so filled with joy, they're so loving, they're so self-controlled, they're so patient... You ought to know that it's not the person that you're actually talking about, but it's God's Spirit that's working in them. And this is important for us. Because the answer to the question, Pastor, how is it that you're so loving? Now, you may not ever ask that question. I'm just throwing it out there. (laughs) Pastor, how is it that you're so loving? The answer ought always to be because the Spirit is yielding that in my life. It's not me. It's him. You see, all the bad stuff in my life, that's my fault. But anything that's good in my life is God working in me. And so that's the first kind of fruit. As we're walking with the Lord, we're supposed to be bearing this kind of fruit. And it's, you've heard people say, well, I'm not a judge, but I can be a fruit inspector. Well, we are to look at that just a little bit and, and see whether someone's walking with the Lord, but never to judge them or condemn them, but really, rather to call them forward in this kind of walk that's pleasing to the Lord. Does that make sense? We're all to be each other's friends here. We're to be on each other's team. We're not to say negative things like, oh, you are not loving. That's just bad, 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 bad. No, not like that. You're like, look, you need to yield to the Spirit. He'll work this out in your life. We go together in this. And so that's the first kind of fruit. The second kind of fruit that Paul talks about is the fruit of disciples. That is more believers who are yielding themselves to the leadership of the Spirit. So when we say we're walking with fruit, we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit on the one hand, but we're talking about the fruit of more believers on the other. And so as remember in verse, uh, in verse 6, well, the, what we looked at last week, he says, this gospel has come to you, as indeed it is of the whole world, is bearing fruit and increasing. Well, when the gospel bears fruit, it does two things. It bears fruit of the, fruit of the Spirit, and it bears fruit of other believers. And that's the way that you know whether a people are succeeding. Is they're increasing in fruit of the Spirit, and they're increasing in disciples. So, we bear fruit as we walk with Him. The second thing I want you to see about walking in accordance with God's will is we increase in the knowledge of God as we walk with Him. So as we walk with Him, we, we learn more and more about Him. We know Him better. 
Does anybody know what Jesus, how Jesus defined eternal life? Does anybody know? Anybody remember John chapter 17 and verse 3? How Jesus describes eternal life? That they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. So the picture of eternal life is knowing God in his fullness. And by the way, eternal life means we're going to know God and know God and know God and know God. And we're going to know him forever. And that's pretty, that's pretty incredible. Do you know that even in heaven we aren't going to know all that we need to know about God? Do you know that? No, let me say that again. I said it bad. Do you know that in heaven we're not even going to know all that there is to know about God? Do you know that? Because God is infinite. He is so much loftier than we are that even after eternity we'll still be trying to know all there is to know about God. Because if we could know God completely all the way through, uh, we know everything there is to know about Him, then we'd be like Him. And we can't be that. But what we can do is strive as we walk with him to know as much of him as he's revealed himself to us and to know him more and more and more and more and more. And so when we walk, when we walk in a manner that's successful, what we're going to do is know God better. Do you know one of the great challenges of being a pastor, of having studied as much as I have, is to, is to combat the, the lazy thought that says, I've achieved what I need to achieve. I don't need to study anymore. I don't need to know him any better. I don't need to walk any further. I don't need to read any more. I don't need to pray any longer. You see, all of those are enemies of knowing God. And we ought to walk with him. We ought to learn more about him. Learn about his love in deeper and greater ways. Understand his grace even stronger and better as we walk with him success is walking in accordance with God's will we increase in the knowledge of God as we walk with him and he strengthens us as we walk with him verse 11 being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy now I like us there's there's one word in the Bible that I like a whole lot and it's there twice can anybody tell me what that word is Look in there. Look, look at verse 11. Tell me what word. It's three letters. It's there twice. And it describes power and might. All. All. Now, I want you to think about something. How much power does God have? All. All. Yeah, we don't know. That's good. We don't know the extent of it. That's for sure. We haven't experienced the extent of it. That's for sure. God has all power. All power. And here in verse 11, it's saying that, he, that Paul is praying for them that they would be strengthened with all power. Now, what, what is it, what barrier, what obstacle could come in your life that you can't overcome if you had all power? Is there anything that could stop you if you had all power? You know I'm setting you up, right? That's why you're not answering? I want you to think about this. As we walk with God and as we yield ourselves to Him, He works through us with all power. He strengthens us. You say, Pastor, you're talking about health and wealth and prosperity. No, I'm not. I'm talking about walking with Jesus in a normal Christian life. That He gives us the power that we need, and it, fall, it, it comes out of this all power. It's all been extended to us through Him. You see... Often, the problem with us Christians is we don't believe God enough. In fact, one of my, one of my prayers that I've, I've adopted over this last year is, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. I, I believe, help me where I don't believe. 
You see, part of our problem is we don't really believe that this is true. And so that we believe that patience and endurance and strength is our business. And so we try to manufacture it in our own lives. Try to be real strong on our own. How many of you have started at the gym this year? Anybody? <laughs> we have one, two, I see a couple. No, I started at the gym. Not, not, not like, you, you like, I'm going to turn over knee. I'm going to start at the gym. I'm going to be really tough and I'm going to be able to do it. And then about this time, we decide, nah, it's not really for me. Often we try to do these things, even the Christian walk. We're like, okay, I'm going to be a better Christian this year. I'm going to really, you know, grip my teeth and I'm going to do this thing. Well, if you're going to grit your teeth and do this thing, you have a, a bad understanding about what the Christian life is. Because the Christian life is calling us to come and really to die. To come and give our lives to the Lord. It's to surrender completely to Him. Say, Lord, not my life but yours. Not my will but yours. And as He begins to work through us, He will build the strength. He will build the endurance. He will bring the joy. He does these kinds of things. And so we yield to Him. So He strengthens us as we walk with Him. Success is knowing God's will. Success is walking in accordance with God's will. And finally, I want you to see this. Success is thanking Him for His will. You say, really? Success is thanking God for what He's done. Absolutely. Listen to these final three words, or three verses, 12, 13, and 14. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We thank him because he's the one that's qualified us to walk according to his will. You see, God is not saying, oh, I just hope that Jim it just graces me with his love and that, oh, Jim would walk with me and that he would do my will. It would just do my God heart proud if Jim would do what I wanted him to do. That's not it at all. What God's saying is, Jim, if you yield to me, I will do my will through you. I will work through you. I will do exactly what I want accomplished. I will qualify you for every good work. I will do this thing in you. All you must do is surrender to me and let me have my way in your life. That's what it means to do God's will, by the way, to surrender and let him. What we want to do is we're like, okay, God, if you give me the Corvette and, and let me play professional baseball, and give me a PhD, then I'll be nice to people occasionally, and I'll go to church every week. How's that? And then you let me into heaven. You see, that's not God's will for our lives. God's will is saying, Lord, I realize that I'm a sinner. I've sinned against you. But Jesus came, and he lived a perfect life, and he died an atoning death in my place, bearing my sin dead on himself at the cross, rose again the third day, so that if I would repent of my sins, which is the same way of saying dying to an old way of life, and walking with Jesus, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And so the picture is, I've died to an old way of life, Jesus has raised me with his life, and because I have his life, I can honor the Lord. And so my wants begin to change. Now, if it's God's will, if, if God has it for me to have a Corvette and to play Major League Baseball and to have a Ph.D. and to be a multimillionaire, well, you see that wasn't his will for my life, but except the Ph.D. part. That's the only one I've got out of all those. But you see, that wasn't God's will for my life. And so often what we're still trying to do is live the will for our lives, our will, and have God bless it. But that's not what he's called his people to do. He's called his people just to give ourselves to him and let him work through us. And when he begins to work through us, he strengthens. He strengthens us. He gives us what we need. He has qualified us. His work, uh, his work through Christ has qualified us. Uh, he's qualified us for the inheritance of all the riches in heaven. And we, we get to be a part of this with all the other saints. He says there, giving thanks to the Father who have qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Whose inheritance? Jesus' inheritance with all the other saints. What does Jesus get? Everything. Everything. 
That's what Jesus gets. He gets everything. That's our inheritance if we're in him. Everything. Because he's qualified us, we thank him. Lord, thank you for giving us all of these things. Because he has delivered us, we thank him. It says there in verse 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Can I get a hallelujah and amen from somebody? Isn't that good? So we ought to thank God because of that. Our our identity, our citizenship is no longer in the domain of darkness, but rather we've been transferred. Transferred. Now that word transfer is a scary word. If you're in the business world, that's a scary word. If you love where you are, you don't want to be transferred. If you don't like where you are, you really, really want to be transferred. In the Army, we said it this way, my two favorite duty stations, the one where I just came from, and the one where I'm going. <laughs> it's never the one where you're at. So we, lo- we like that idea of transfer. But in this case, we are being transferred from the kingdom of darkness, or the domain of darkness. This domain of darkness is a place of sin. It's a place of hate. It's a place of cruelty. It's a, haste, a place where everything is not as it should be. And he's taken us from there, and he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. The kingdom of light, this kingdom that that will forever stand. The kingdom of darkness, it is passing away. It won't last. But the kingdom of his light, the kingdom of 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 his beloved son, it'll last forever. And that's what he's done for us, and so we ought to thank him for that. Our lives ought to be pouring out in this kind of thanksgiving because it's God's will for us that we be thankful in all things. So success is thanking him for his will because he's delivered us because he's transferred us because he's qualified us you say pastor you didn't talk about our success let me tell you about our success our success is giving everything that we know about ourselves to everything that we know about jesus and the more that we learn about jesus the more we give And the more we learn about ourselves, the more we give. So that God manufactures, manifests, produces, yields fruit in our life as we give our lives to him. So that our lives become his. So that our will becomes his. Because our ways become his. You say, well, pastor, that's pretty extreme. Yeah, that's what it is. Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he will deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. That's the picture of this. We deny ourselves, we give everything to him, and then he manufactures it through us so that on the day that we stand before him, and he says, are you you successful? The answer is, Lord, you know. It's your life. It's what you've done. I've just only given myself to you. You say, Pastor, how do we respond to this? Well, first notice this was a prayer from Paul to them. He was praying that they would be successful in these ways. And so we ought to pray for one another for this kind of success. You know, we have prayer, uh, we have prayer meetings, and we pray for lots of different things, but seldom do we ever pray for this kind of success. That you'd be filled with all strength, that you'd know God, that you would walk with Him. That's a great prayer. We ought to pray that for one another. You say, how else should I respond to this? If you've never come to a place where you've repented of your sins and trusted Christ, you ought to do that today. You ought to say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again on the third day. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so he calls us to to follow him. And so if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, I invite you to do that. If you're a believer, you've trusted Christ, your life is his and his is yours. But you would say, I'm kind of living for myself more than I'm living for him right now. Then I call you to repentance You don't need to do anything public. I'm not like asking you to walk the aisle and say anything to me or even come and pray, although you may. You can do both. 
But this is something in your heart where you say, Lord, I want to live my life for you. I want your will to be my will. I want your spirit to, to lead me day by day. And so I'm asking you, Lord, today, would you lead me? I repent of trying to do it on my own. It's possible that you're here today and you know, you know that God's will for your life is to join with this congregation in order to walk with us towards the future, whatever God would have for you and for us together. It's possible that you want to respond to this invitation this morning by joining our church. I'd love to tell you how. You just need to come. Whatever God wants you to do this morning, I invite you to respond to him, either publicly or right where you are in your seat. But my prayer is that nobody leaves here today thinking, A, the Christian life is about what you can do for God, and B, that you don't leave here not knowing the Lord Jesus Christ.